Are we all set? Right. Yep. All right. Yes, we are. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, a webcast, an online show, uh, whatever you want to call us. Um, whatever we are to you, we are here live every Wednesday morning at uh, 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website, and all of our shows are recorded, and the recordings are posted onto our website for you to watch in our archives, along with any slides that may be available, um, whatever the presentation was, and links to anything that's mentioned during our shows. Our show, both our live show and our recorded shows are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with any of your colleagues or friends that you might think may be um, interested in anything we're, showing, we're presenting here. Um, but we do a mixture of things here at the um, at Encompass Live. We do um, interviews, mini training sessions, um, book review sessions. Basically, if anything that is library related, we are um, happy to have it on the show. Um, we also, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations. Um, but sometimes we bring in guest speakers from, well, basically anywhere. <laughs> um, as we And that's what we have today. Uh, on the line with us is Dana Longley. Hi, Dana. Hello. Good morning. And she is at um, SUNY Empire State College, which uh, the college is based in Saratoga, correct? Uh, partly, yes. Partly. <laughs> um, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Yeah, she, yeah, I know it's a, yeah, <laughs> um, and she works um, there in, in their uh, library, and she has a um, very interesting type of position, which I assume you'll explain there, but um, Dana is actually Saratoga Springs, um, New York, where Empire State College is, as Dana is partially um, located, is my hometown. Actually, I'm from Saratoga, moved to Nebraska here about 15 years ago, and Dana and I actually went to high school together. We um, went to high school together and then went off our separate ways and both went into the library world and met up again, I don't know, five or six years ago, I can't remember how long ago, at a, at a library conference in D.C., Washington, D.C. So um, I thought it was pretty cool to have Dana on the show and talk about this um, patron-driven um, ebook acquisition. I know a lot of people are doing patron-driven acquisition for things, um, for both ebooks through Digital Library Loan and whatnot, but I wanted Dana to come on and show us how they're doing this here at Empire State College. So I will just hand over to you. All right. Well, thanks so much yeah. for, for having me. Of course. Um, so I guess I'll just uh, start. And by the way, I'll just I'll probably say this a couple times. If anybody has any questions as I'm going along, please just you know type it in or, or mm -hmm. ask uh, Krista to turn on your microphone. Um, I'd rather me not just blather at you guys for for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so if you can you know think of any questions or comments or anything like that, we want to share your own experiences. Um, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm but, happy uh, to interrupt whenever. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, um, as you said, my name is Dana Longley. I am, uh, our college administrative offices are based in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, we're part of SUNY, which is the State University of New York system, which is 64 separate campuses. Um, it's a pretty large state system. Um, although I like to think of Empire State College as sort of the black sheep of the SUNY system because we are very different than most of your, your regular colleges. We are as a library, online only. We have no physical brick and mortar building. We have no physical collections. So as you can imagine, given that sort of uh, very summary of what we do, ebooks are uh, a very important part of our collection development. Um, so I'm going to talk about why we chose this model, why we chose this vendor, how we're doing it, some of the things we encountered in the three years that we've been um, uh, going with this program. Okay, so let me go forward here. So let me just uh, step back a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I do and what our college consists of in a minute. Um, and just talk about PDA, patient-driven acquisition, from a sort of a holistic perspective. Um, the model, I'm sure most people are aware, is sort of a just-in-time sort of model, rather than sort of the traditional. Um, library collection development model of just in case. In other words, you know, the librarians select materials just in case a patron would want to use it. And obviously, print collections, there's lots of studies out there that show, you know, either the 80, 80, 20 or 80, uh, 
what can sometimes be called the 86 rule. In other words, 80% um, of usage of our collections is only used in 6% of our actual materials. So it's not, in a lot of cases, the most effective use of our monies, right? And we're all probably experiencing um, dwindling monies, and especially as journals and subscriptions and um, books and then various things become more and more expensive, right? So that's a very important thing that um, PDA allows us to alleviate a little bit. Um, in the past, before we started with the, the PDA program, we, uh, because we are, and I'll explain this in a minute, we are a very, very small staff with a very large um, student population. We don't have um, the staff to do, to have dedicated people um, choosing materials, so we pretty much rely on aggregate collections from vendors for our ebooks as well as our journals and other materials. Um, so, um, given that, we probably um, fall into, before we use PDA, into the sort of 86, 86 rule. In other words, um, all the materials that we're paying for, and we ac have access to millions of full text materials, um, there's probably only a small percentage of those that our, our, our students and faculty were actually using. Um, and one of the other things that um, I've I've discovered in sort of reading the literature on PDA is that as far as collection development goes, PDA, in, in, in the academic field anyways, um, allows you to sort of identify possible emerging fields of study, um, especially in a traditional model where you have subject specialists who are choosing just within their subject specialty. It doesn't leave a whole lot of room for recognizing when a new sort of cross-disciplinary field might be arising. Um, and so, in other, in, in other words, you're sort of playing catch-up a lot of times when you're collecting materials for something that might be arising out of a, a, a cross-disciplinary field that you might not necessarily know exists or is just arising. So PDA allows you to identify those things because you're adding in a bunch of stuff that you're not paying for and then you can see, all right, what are the actual materials that our, that our students, our faculty are interested in? So it allows you to say, identify, at least potentially say, oh, well, we might not have noticed that there's this, this new field of, of whatever it may be, and maybe we want to focus our, our more traditional uh, collection development efforts on that as well. Okay. So, as a little background, some abbreviations that I will use to sort of speed things up a little bit. Empire State College, we often use the abbreviation ESC. Um, PDA, obviously, I've already used it. It stands for Patron-Driven Acquisitions. Another uh, sort of parallel to that is DDA, um, Demand-Driven Acquisitions. It's basically the same thing as PDA. Another one that I'll use a lot is STL. It stands for Short-Term Loan, and I'll explain how the short-term loan fits into the PDA model in a minute. Another one I probably won't mention too much, but it might come up once or twice, is YPB Yankee Book Publisher. Um, and, and most of you are probably familiar with that as well. So um, we use, as, as we said, uh, the ProQuest eBrary um, vendor for our uh, PDA program. And eBrary is, by, by uh, a large amount, our largest, even before PDA, it's our largest collection of eBook materials. Um, prior to PDA, we had about 100,000 titles through um, our eBrary subscription um, of what's called the Academic Complete Collection, um, where, where basically eBrary selects the titles, and we just pay a bulk cost for whatever titles they happen to throw in there. Um, so obviously that's not necessarily ideal because most vendors will, you know, and this is true in, in journal models as well, for any aggregate materials, they're going to throw in, uh, uh, you know, some really good stuff, and then they're going to throw in a bunch of stuff that maybe is not the best stuff, not the most used stuff, not the most asked for or requested materials to sort of give you, to sort of fluff up the, 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 the count of materials in there, but they might not necessarily be the best ones. So let me talk about some more sort of eBrary defined definitions that will they uh, sort of use in their PDA model. The, the biggest one is the, the, the concept of the trigger, 
which basically means any time a user um, uses um, one of the materials that we've selected for our PDA program um, in a certain way, it um, triggers a usage, an official usage of the material, which means that we get charged a certain amount. Um, and that can be, the, what, what, what does a trigger consist of? It can be a, a copy of text, download of uh, pages, or printing off of pages. It, and it would have to be, um, as far as viewing something online, because you do have the option to just read the, the eBooks online, they have to be viewing 10 pages, um, or it has to be 10 minutes of real continuous usage. In other words, if someone just goes to the title page and then just goes off and does something else, that's not going to trigger a, uh, an official usage. It's not going to trigger a, um, a, a cost for us. So the, with these things, um, it sort of ensures that, at least to a certain level, that we're only going to be charged for things that students and faculty members are actually using in a, 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 a basically real way. So I mentioned in the abbreviations, STL, short-term loan. So in addition to just, you know, when a usage will um, result in a trigger, it doesn't necessarily um, result in an automatic purchase of that title. Ebrary offers the option to, instead of going to a direct purchase, you instead first get a short-term loan of one or seven days by the user. And you can set up, um, in the administrative uh, end, you can set up how many short-term loans between, it can be between zero and three, before an item is purchased. And a short-term loan um, will then cost, it'll still be a trigger, but it'll only cost a percentage of the actual purchase price of the ebook. And when we started, the average um, purchase multiplier is in the, the, the second, the third term listed there, results, it, it's a, it was about 10% of the actual cost of the uh, of the any title was was on average, it can differ depending on the publisher. Um, but so that was a pretty good deal. So we originally set it up so that we had two loans short-term loans before, and then on the third trigger, um, a purchase of the actual ebook would occur. So there's a couple different ways of looking at, at this from a cost perspective, and I'll talk more about this um, in a little bit. But basically, um, when something is used multiple times, when it's triggered multiple times, you end up actually paying a little more for the title because you're paying for two short-term loans, which say, you know, at the beginning was 10%. So that's, you know, you pay 20% of the price for two short-term loans, and then you pay the full price for the third trigger. So you're actually paying about 140% of the cost of the actual book if you just purchased it outright. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the ec economics of it in a minute. Um, and then I talked about we also have the uh, collection of subscription ebooks from eBrary, and that's called Academic Complete. Okay. So... Go back to, and I'll come back to the to the to the economics and the costs and the the setup of things. But let's go back and talk a little bit more about what uh, we do here at Empire State College. Um, just some generic uh, background about our institution. We have an FTE about 8,400 students, although that consists of primarily adult distance learners. Um, we have approximately 20,000 students enrolled in the college at any one time. Um, in addition, when I said we were only partly located in Saratoga, that's just our main administrative office. We actually have 35 locations around New York State, so we are in pretty much all the major cities um, and a bunch of other places where we have blended learning models. And then we have um, about 50% is uses that blended learning where students will meet one-on-one -on -one with what we call mentors. And they'll uh, design what kind of independent studies and, and other online classes they might take, or they might meet in a, during a residency or once a month with a class uh, blended learning model. And then about 50% of our students are fully online students. Um, and they can do it from any location. We have um, offices actually um, overseas in several locations like Turkey and um, 
I'm, I'm blanking out on a couple other places, but we have about five different places um, overseas in, in, in our international programs. We offer through our blended and, and fully online courses hundreds of courses, different courses every term, and that when you count sections, that adds up to probably about a thousand different um, different course sections at any in, in any one term. As I mentioned, we're a fully online library. Given this model, obviously, um, all of our students are distant from us, so having a, an actual print library uh, would not do the vast majority of our students any good. So um, we were instituted in 1974, and from that time onward, um, there's never been a physical library. It's always been, even when it, we were a simple correspondence college in the 70s, it was um, more just... Um, librarians supporting the learning through whatever distance uh, ways they could. We do have um, interlibrary loan, although you can you might be asking yourself, well, how can without a physical library, how can they reciprocate um, interlibrary loan since we don't have anything to actually loan? Well, what we do is we have worked out uh, an agreement with the University of Buffalo. Again, they're part of the, the SUNY system. And they process our interlibrary loan requests for us. And they take items that are requested from our faculty um, and our graduate students. And they um, look first in their collections. And they'll send it in a, w along with a self-addressed stamped envelope to our students um, directly to their home or work addresses, wherever they put into the system. And um, and if, in addition, if they don't have it in their collections, they will. They have the option to purchase it from Amazon, have it sent directly to the requester. But then, the the end result is our students and our faculty then have to return those items to the University of Buffalo. So as you can imagine, sending these items out, um, purchasing them, um, having them sent back to the University of Buffalo library is a costly endeavor. It's much. It's a little more costly than traditional in a library loan. So it does have a high cost and for that reason we actually have to restrict access to our interlibrary loan system to graduate students which we have about 500 graduate students and faculty only. Our undergraduate students do not get access to interlibrary loan. So as you can imagine that creates um, a big hole as far as resources especially for our undergraduate students and that is where this PDA program really allowed us to supplement um, a lot of the materials that we have available. Now as far as staff within the library itself, including myself, there are only four librarians. Um, and so we're supporting 20,000 students and about 500 to 600 faculty and adjuncts. Um, we don't have any support staff or student workers because I, we work in an office building in Saratoga. Um, so that obviously places large limitations on what we can offer our students, what we can offer our faculty, um, and PDA, as I'll talk about more, al again, allows us to do this in a very sustainable way given our limited staffing. Um, and we've been doing this program, this, this PDA program, since September of 2013. So we're just about at the three-year mark um, as far as gathering statistics and data, which I will talk in more detail in, in a few minutes. So let me just pause here and see if, if Krista, is there any, any questions or anything like that yet? Um, sure. Um, nothing has come in yet. Anybody, if anybody does have any questions, comments, um, like we said, type them into your question section. If you have a microphone, we can unmute you and you can ask your question that way, of course. Um, I was just going to say, as you're describing the Empire State, it's, I'm sure it's very different from what most libraries <laughs> are involved in as far as not having a physical library and having so few staff supporting such a huge number of students. Um, and faculty across the whole state. Um, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's, you know, as you can imagine, it's an, it's an uphill battle, even just mm -hmm. getting students and, and even, even sometimes faculty, especially adjuncts, aware that we exist, let mm -hmm. alone of the services and resources that we have available. Yeah. So it's something that we have to constantly work on. Um, as you, yeah, typical of many of us. <laughs> yes. In libraries, um, yeah. <laughs> So here is uh, what I put up on the screen now is a snapshot of our ebook collections. We actually have um, 
Now let me just go to the part of my notes here where I have some statistics. We have about 200, currently we have about 200, almost 227,000 ebooks available to our users. Um, and about 77% of those are from eBrary, and that consists of, as you can see, the Academic Complete, which is our subscription titles, which we don't select. Um, and then there's about 34% of our collection is currently made up of the titles that we've added to our collection, although not technically added them, but we've made them available to our users through the patron-driven acquisition program. And that's about 99,000. Um, close, well, I think it, we just went over 100,000 ebooks through that PDA program. We also have subscriptions to several other um, collections Springer, um, ACLS, Credo, Oxford Reference, EBSCO. We have some from them. Right American Fiction, Women in Social Movements, or some of the other sort of smaller collections that we make available as ebooks as well. Another thing I should mention is to take a quick step back. Um, one of the other advantages that our students have since they're uh, primarily from New York State, but we have students from, from all over the country and all over the world, um, any students who get our uh, college photo ID can actually visit any local SUNY library. So if they're living like out in Buffalo or Rochester or down in New York City, they can actually borrow circulating materials from nearby um, SUNY libraries. So that is another way that our students can supplement, because obviously not everything, especially when you're talking about books, is available online electronically. Mm -hmm. But that is still limiting factors. A lot of students um, are located in rural locations who can't um, drive to a, a college library that might be 50 miles away or what have you. So this is, again, another way for us to um, enhance those services and resources available to those students. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about once we made the decision to go with the eBrary PDA program. And it was a pretty easy um, process for us because we were already heavily invested in eBrary. We had purchased several hundred books to them. We, had, um, we spent tens of thousands of dollars to that academic collection every year subscribing to that, and it gets heavy usage. So it was a pretty easy process. Um, thing for us, and, and they were first out of the gate as far as offering a PDA model. There have been since been other vendors that have gone that way. JSTOR now has a PDA model, um, and I believe EBSCO um, is, is experimenting with that model as well. As far as in the academic world, I'm, sh I'm not sure as far as vendors that, that cater to like public libraries and other libraries, um, if, there are, if those vendors are moving in that way as well. I would imagine some of them are um, because it's it's pretty much a win-win situation for publishers, for the vendors, and for libraries, especially given our unique sort of uh, distance uh, situation. So some of the sort of things we had to grapple with as far as setting up the program, and we started out, like with most things, we, we framed it as a pilot program for uh, one year. Um, but obviously we've gone beyond that and it's a full-blown program now. Um, the first thing where we had to decide is well, what were the number of triggers that would um, result in a purchase. And that first thing we decided um, was the third trigger would result in a purchase. And then what titles to include. Ebrary as far as books that you can add to a PDA program, they have probably several hundred thousand titles that aren't in that subscription model that you can add through the PDA program. So we had to grapple with, okay, what kind of materials do we want to include? Do we want to have the potential to just put a, you know, just put everything in there, um, or do we want to be more selective? And as you can imagine, there, you know, uh, librarians in, in general are not keen, I think, or uh, instinctively don't like to give up that sort of control. But we decided um, in the end to do that. We you know, had some very loose parameters as far as what titles and what languages, et cetera, to include, to make available to our students. Um, but other than that, we, don't, we didn't have the staff or the time to um, go through and, and filter a lot of the stuff. So we made available, as, and I apologize about my phone going off, um, as many things as possible to our students. 
and then let them make the selections. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the future. Um, there is also the option to prevent turnaways. In other words, a lot of these titles um, have restrictions that are put up there, and it can differ from publisher to publisher, by the way, um, about you know when you provide access, it's usually a single user license. So in other words, only one person can access a particular title at one time. So there are um, ways, there's a, an additional sort of product that eBray offers to prevent a student being turned away if someone else is using the title um, to do that. But in looking at the statistics that, that we have, we, did, we there was like maybe one in the, you know, in the first year of this program, there was maybe one turn away total. So we decided not to go with that option, but it is there. Um, and then, you know, also when a trigger actually results in an actual purchase, there are multiple options for some titles. Again, again it can differ from title to title and from publisher to publisher. Um, the full range of options are a single user license, and then there's this, uh, often a three user license, which is obviously more. And then in some cases, there's a, uh, a, a multiple user license, which is basically unlimited um, simultaneous uses. We opted um, for cost concerns primarily to um, just automatically go to a single user uh, license purchase, and then we can always um, adjust it later. And eBray has it set up so that if you decide that oh this particular title is getting a lot of a lot of use, we want to uh, purchase a three-person or a multiple license, we can just pay the difference. Um, and uh, the cost of that, you know, if if say you know, the single user license is 100% of the cost. A three user license is, you know, probably about 150 to 200 to 250% of the cost. And then a multiple one can be, it can get up there. It depends on the publisher. Again, they set the prices. And then there also is the option when you're setting this kind of model up is do we want to, do you want to approve a purchase um, manually before it's actually purchased? You have the option to do that. Um, we decided against that. We decided to say, all right, let's. Um, and then there. Do you have the. Uh, whatever our. All stuff we. This might be super expensive. Can do that. And also, of course, when you're, um, and I didn't mention this, when you're deciding what titles to include in to make available, you also have an option to limit, for example, by cost. So when we it off to $250. So we decided anything that's more uh, expensive than that, we are going to not make that available, just simply for, for cost. Um, then we had to decide, do we want to make available um, titles um, in the short-term loan part of it, available for one day, which is usually about a 10% cost at the beginning, or a seven day, which is you know about 20 to 25% of the cost. And we decided at first to um, go with the seven day length loan so that if a student triggered a use and they're you know actually using the, the material, they wouldn't necessarily come back the next day and then again trigger another 10% cost. Instead, they would um, still be within the seven-day length of the loan, and they would just it wouldn't trigger another usage for us. And the other option we we um, weighed a little bit was: Do we want to add? These titles, and uh, when we first set it up, we added about a hundred thousand titles. Um, do we want to add all these things to our catalog? And uh, just to explain a little bit, our catalog is not like a traditional library catalog. Our catalog is solely of ebooks, because um, obviously we don't have any print books. But we wanted to say, all right, okay, so if we decide, you know, and this is just at this point just the pilot, do we want to go through the sort of uh, hard process of adding all these titles to our catalog and then we might need to pull them out at some point. Um, and you know you always try and avoid making it seem like you're taking things away from your your user base, right? But we decided that, you know, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and add those to the catalog as a crucial way 
for students to become aware of these things rather than just going directly to the ePrairie search interface. They can find these titles through our catalog as well. And then we had to decide you know, how much money are we going to put into the budget for this. And we, had, we decided to, to start with, for uh, I think we decided around a $10,000 um, uh, budget limit to put into an initial pool that any purchases that were triggered would draw from. Okay, And then you can opt um, at a later date to add more to that as money starts going down. Okay. I think, I think it's great, Dana, to hear about all those different options you have for the ways that it can work, because I know I've heard a lot of people with all the, this PDA stuff be very um, wary and afraid of it, that it might, you know, be a free-for-all, <laughs> and things just go crazy with every pa patron's just wa and wanting a single thing for one try, and then it never gets used again. But knowing that you've got all of those limits and requirements and different ways you can do it, I think is very helpful. Yeah, and, you know, certainly for us, um, you know, and, and I'll, sh and I'll uh, talk a, bit, a little bit, a little bit uh, more about it when I talk, look at some of the statistics here in a minute. Um, having the ability to only pay 10% of the title when, you know, a lot of our books are only going to be used once. Mm -hmm. but, oh, so yeah. instead of paying full price for it, you're paying 10, 20% for it. That is a cost of way. Yeah, that's an awesome way to do it. Material. Additional collection development model. Now, as far as the launch, as I mentioned we we um, started it and framed it um, to the people that were you know giving us money for this stuff as a pilot. Um, one of the other things is, and this was intentional. It's not something you necessarily want to promote because one of the things, if you actually say, oh, we have this model, this PDA model, and it's triggered this way you could potentially get people that can game the model, right? You, you know, and, and um, you could get some faculty that just want to say, all right, I'm just going to go in there and, you know, my specialty is archaeology and I'm just going to go in there and do 10 minutes of usage in every title because I want my library to purchase all these. And then um, that would be a potential um, example of something, go, you know, getting into a, run, uh, a runaway model where all of a sudden, oh, why is all, you know, why is like a hundred books this week been um, triggered in this particular field? Well, somebody might have gotten wind of it, but I think we did a pretty good job of just framing it as, all right, we've made available these additional titles. 100,000 titles have been added to ours, and from a user perspective, um, they can't tell the difference when they're searching the catalog or when they're searching eBrary directly. They can't tell the difference. There's no nothing from their perspective that is a difference from something that we subscribe to or something that we've already purchased and something that we've only made available through the PDA model, which we haven't yet purchased. There's no, you, they can't tell the difference. Um, so in addition to no promotion actually being needed besides saying, you know, we're, we've made all these extra titles um, available, um, you actually don't want to tell people that you are using this sort of model. Um, as far as launch maintenance, um, including all the decisions as far as setup um, is needed, and as well as, especially in the beginning when naturally my boss and, and, and her boss and, and everyone else was a little nervous about giving up this control and not being able, I mean, one of the biggest concerns is, well, how do we know how much it's going to cost? Um, what happens if we spend that $10,000 in two months? Uh, what do we do then? We'll have to pull it off and that, you know, pull it down. And people may notice that and say, oh, well, you took away all these books that were, were there a, a month ago. What happened? Um, so one of the things that um, I had to do um, is sort of monitor, especially in the beginning, it monitor the usage. And you can, get, you can set it up on the administrative side to be, to be notified anytime anything is triggered, and especially when anything is actually um, purchased you can get notifications and you can also go onto the administrator site and see you know day by day what things have been triggered what things have been purchased how much it's these things cost etc um, so it, it does take a little bit of uh, manual work to sort of monitor that especially in the beginning so you can get a handle on you know have we set up this thing do we need to tweak some of our settings to make sure that the costs um, are, are, are going to meet our needs, et cetera. But the good thing is eBrary 
you know, I think has done a fairly good job of giving you a lot of flexibility in a lot of those options. Okay, so let me just talk in general about some of the upsides and downsides of this model um, from our perspective. And this is just from us. Obviously, it'll be different for every institution depending on their unique environment. For us, the upsides were, you know, pretty straightforward. We were able to add um, 100,000 new titles to our collection at no um, upfront cost, basically. Well, we will the 10,000 that wasn't yet spent yet, but that's a pretty good deal. Um, and obviously, you know, in theory, um, and this actually worked out, we, we only actually end up paying for titles that are truly used. Um, so that is a big plus. Another thing, at going forward over the last three years, it's relatively easy to monitor and select and add new titles as they're added to the eBrary catalog. Um, so every month, I usually go in, do some searches, um, do a little bit of fil you know quick filtering, and then make those new titles available um, in our collections to our users. And there are also some you know not great, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Some uh, tools to where you can track usage and track your spending um, on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year type of way. Um, they're not the most robust tools, um, and, and as you guys, fellow librarians, probably know, vendors are not the best at giving us the best um, statistical tools. That's not a priority for them, obviously. Um, and I found as the person who gathers all the usage statistics from all our vendors, um, you know, it, it's not the best on eBrary's end either. So now as far as downsides, the biggest one was, and uh, the, what I'm showing here on this is a very crude chart, and you, uh, hopefully you can read some of it, is the average cost per trigger. So in other words, what was the cost over time of a, 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 an individual title trigger, a real usage of a book. It started out below $20 per trigger. And just to give you some context there, as I mentioned, our interlibrary loan requests cost about $25 to $30 per request. So this was cheaper than an interlibrary loan request for us. However, and I'll talk uh, more about this in a minute, the publishers, since this model was just as new to them as uh, to us, they started making adjustments, and over time, over the three years, we've been notified several times of groups of publishers um, making adjustments to their costs. Okay, and the, the end result of that, both to the percentage the uh, of the the cost for short-term loans, as well as to the some of the purchase costs as well, but mostly to the short-term loan percentage costs. So, in other words, originally the average was around. 10% of the purchase price of a book, it's probably gone up to about 20 to 25% per title on average um, for a one-day short-term loan um, in the times in three years since. So that represents sort of increasing cost for us, and that was a major concern. Uh, so talk a little bit more about the publisher cost increases. Um, around Two thousand, you know, mid two thousand, beginning, well, maybe beginning of two thousand fourteen through the end of two thousand fourteen, pretty much every major publisher that was included in the eBrary collections um, demanded some short-term loan price increases. Um, so, uh, you know, what many uh, publishers started out at ten to fifteen percent for a one-day short-term loan, um, it went up to twenty-five, thirty-five, forty percent. So, obviously, the publishers. From their perspective, um, and this is just my guess, I don't have any inside information about you know, how they made these, um, these decisions, but my guess is you know, they did some sort of cost-benefit analysis and they saw that you know, institutions using this model were probably getting more value than they wanted to give. Um, so a lot of the publishers increased the cost of those, those short-term loans 50 to 150%. Um, over the course of 2014. So these are just a couple examples from a single announcement. And that, I think that single announcement from June of 2014 included about 10 different publishers that had, you know, sort of just 
way ramped up the cost of their short-term loan percentages. And then in addition, I think you know this model probably spooked some publishers, and some publishers actually went the extra step and actually removed um, the majority or all of their titers, titles from being available for a short-term loan altogether. So um, publishers have the option to only make titles available for uh, purchase, direct purchase, or they can just make it available um, for a PDA model, in other words, knocking out the short-term loan, but you can add it as a PDA, but it will, uh, the first trigger, trigger will purchase, will trigger a purchase instead of a short-term loan. So a lot of publishers opted to do that. But that still left us, um, even given these cost increases and given, you know, removal of some titles, eBay con is constantly um, adding new titles, constantly, um, I think my guess is, you know, uh, approaching other publishers to try and add stuff into it. So in the end, there's, there still has been really no serious shortage of titles that we can make available um, for our short-term loan focused um, usage of the PDA model. Okay. So let me talk a little bit more about the, the overall costs of this, this model for us um, over the last, last three years. Um, as I mentioned, we made, we've made available about 100,000 um, unique titles. Um, through this program and that, you know, we've adjusted things. We, we've ad had to adjust things because obviously when those uh, publisher cost increases first hit us, we went into a little bit of panic mode and said, oh my God, that's like a, you know, that could potentially give us a three times increase in the cost of this program. So we scaled back the titles that we made available um, at that time in the beginning of 2014. But, um, that actually proved not necessarily so. We've we've scaled back our, our filters and we've made more and more titles available, even the ones that we sort of consider the bad seeds, those publishers that, for example, jumped from 10% to 40% um, of a short-term loan um, multiplier. You know, at first we said, oh, we're you know we're going to punish them for making those those vast increases, but it turned out that we could handle that you know that cost given our budget, and we've we've opened it up a little more. So over the three years, the number of user triggers have occurred in total 2,945. Uh, the number of titles that were unique, whereas they were only uh, 176 titles. Okay. Um, you know, a little less than five. The list price of all those 2,476 titles was almost 200 but the amount that we spent on them was only 50, just less than $52,000. Over three years, for us, that's a, a pretty good deal. The cost per short-term loan um, over the course of those three years has been about 1760 which is, again, much cheaper than our interlibrary loan costs per title, per usage. Um, the number of titles that we've actually purchased, um, in other words, they've either had three or currently we've set it up so that there has to be three short-term loans and then the fourth usage results in a purchase. So it's only resulted in 99 actual titles purchased. And some of you may be thinking, well, well so that means you only own you know, you spent 52000 or in, the, in total $62,000, and you've only actually purchased 100 titles. And from that perspective, it might look bad, but I would look at it as, you know, a student-centered thing. We've provided almost 3,000 books of, you know, actually needed books to our students and faculty for the cost of $62,000, and we've made available a vast larger percentage of that um, for people that, you know, they probably looked at these things, but maybe didn't um, trigger an actual usage. So those those 99 purchases um, cost us about $10,000, and so the total spent for this program over three years has been just over $62,000, which, from our perspective, um, given our original um, budget was was more than we had planned for, but we made adjustments and we decided that um, the additional costs. Um, over time, we're actually well worth it, 
and we've been overall very pleased with this program. Um, considering we spend about, um, you know, for give, you know, just to give an example, you know, we can spend twenty thousand dollars on, um, you know, uh, 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 an aggregate database. And we, we, you know, they might get lots of usage, like searches, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of the stuff in there is going to be truly used, useful to our students and faculty. So we regard this sixty-two thousand dollars as well-spent money. So um, a couple, just sort of general impacts. Um, it allowed us to, in one shot, increase our ebook collection size by thirty-three percent. In other words, we said, you know, all right, we had about um, I forgot what we had, but you know, maybe 200,000 books through all our collections, and then we add another 100,000, and then bam, we've just, you know, almost, you know, doubled the, the cost of our, our, the size of our ebooks available to our users. It allowed us, and this, I put a question mark after this because it's not, there's not a direct, I've not been able to sort of pro prove a direct correlation, but in the three years that we've done this program, there has been a, uh, a decrease in the number of interlibrary loan requests and one of the things we've also been able to do is through this program any requests that come in for through interlibrary loan we filter them first before they go to the University of Buffalo and we check to make sure um, they're not available as a title we can um, add to PDA or even you know just purchase directly because we can make a cost-benefit analysis and say oh this book costs forty dollars you know, we can purchase it through eBrary, or we can spend twenty-five to thirty dollars to pay University of Buffalo to purchase it for their collections for a one-time use for for our user. So um, it allows us to give us those those additional options as well. And the biggest thing I think for us has been that this PDA program allows us, and I'll show this in more concrete um, terms in a minute. Um, it allows us to add the newest titles that are available. Um, through our subscription models of ebooks, through that academic complete and other collections, the you know it, they're much slower to add n the newest titles to those subscription collections. Whereas we have much more ability to say, all right, each month I'm going to go in and you know find the newest titles that are available for this model and put them in there and make them available to our students and our faculty. Okay, so that was a big impact um, for us with that. Okay, so here I would just want to—I did a comparison between, and this is just for a single month, but I also did a year-to-date comparison, um, which came out with pretty much the same same results. And I compared the date of publication to those titles that were um, uh, actually used um, in our subscription collections versus those that were actually used in our PDA um, collections, and. Let me just get to that in my notes. So as you can see, you know, and hopefully you can see this, and, and I apologize if the, the font is too small. Um, you know, up to 1999, um, Academic Complete, our subscription titles are in blue, and our PDA titles are in red. Um, there's much more of an emphasis in our subscription collections from titles that are 10 to at least five years old. Whereas if you go forward, at least especially in the last two years, titles that have been published in the last two years, it's no contest. There's 138 titles that were actually used in July by our users from 2014 and 2015 versus only seven that were um, actually used from the Academic Complete collection. And I think that is a pretty good reflection of um, us being able to um, provide much more um, timely um, titles into our PDA program than eBrary does directly through the academic complete subscription model mm -hmm. that we also um, pay for. Okay. So you're going to be uh, getting rid of academic complete, or is that too no. <laughs> a little too crazy? <laughs> no. Um, yeah. You know, academic complete for us is still a good deal. It'll, mm -hmm. you know, th there's 127,000 titles that are available yeah. through that academic complete model for us, and it it gets lots of usage. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't, you know, the, the downsides any of those sort of 
you know, vendor selected titles is it does and it's not the most current stuff. Right. So this is just a way to supplement that in our in our view. So let's look a little bit more about sort of um, some of the user behaviors that we noticed in looking at some of the statistics in this stuff. So this is just a chart of over the last three years the number of triggers that have happened. Um, and this was obviously something we were keenly um, looking at, especially from the beginning. And as you can see, um, hopefully in December of 2013, only like basically three months into the program, we had we saw a huge spike of triggers, and that cost us a ton of money that that month. And that was when we made that decision. Um, all right, we better scale back this program a little bit um, because we we just don't have the money budgeted to do this. But as you can see, if you look at it, take a step back and look at it overall. You know, once that sort of initial thing went through, it's pretty much solidified into, and you know, we need more years data to actually prove this. But you know, the costs are a little more um, sort of predictable over the last two years. You can see they sort of go up throughout the year. Um, at the end of each term, there's a spike because those students are uh, a lot of times probably rushing to um, get books for for their papers and things like that. Um, my guess is, as far as that going back to that December 13 spike, my guess is, and I don't have any data to prove this, but you know, some faculty member got you know got wind of what we were doing and may have gone in there and triggered a bunch of stuff, um, or maybe it was a student that just figured out. I'm not sure, um, but that's been an, that was an anomaly as far as the number of triggers, um, and it hasn't been repeated, so I'm not sure what you know what happened there. Some more user behavior. You know what kinds of triggers. In other words, we can track through the statistics. You know what action by the user resulted in a trigger. Um, so in most cases, it was actually a view, which is the blue section here. 68% of the triggers were simply by students viewing 10, either 10 or more pages within a title, or viewing. Um, uh, continuous usage of pages within the within the title for more than 10 minutes. Um, 17. The next was 17% were actually copying text from within one of the titles, um, and then lower down. And this is uh, the lower down as far as chapter downloads and printing, um, because uh, this is I think you know fit what we expected because a lot of the publishers will put barriers in front of printing or downloading some of the things. One of the things eBrary says, and my guess is this is um, dictated by the publishers, that in order to download or print um, materials from any ebook, a student needs to actually go in and create their own personal eBrary account. So that's an extra step that a student or faculty member has to go through in order to do that sort of action. And a lot of titles are just not available as far as, for example, downloading the entire book or printing off the entire book. You can, and a lot of times, um, and again, this will differ from publisher to publisher, you can pr only print off like 20, 30, or 60 pages. Um, it, it can, it can uh, vary wildly. So some more stuff I did, some more comparisons between Academic Complete and our PDA titles. Um, so this is, uh, in the top part here, I did a year-to-date comparison, the number of titles that were actually used um, within Academic Complete um, was way larger than PDA, and I think, and I don't necessarily have the definitive definition for why this is, um, but my guess is that uh, uh, there were some titles in Academic Complete, because we've subscribed to that collection for I think about a decade or so, um, that there are uh, a few titles in that that get very heavy usage. So my guess is that, and um, well I know for a fact that there's some courses and some faculty members that point students to specific titles within that subscription collection, they've been doing it for years, and they've stuck with that, so that results in a lot high usage of those titles, some of them might have even incorporated into some of the assignments they're doing. So from uh, you know just from January uh, 2015 to the present, this is the usage in the top here from Academic Complete and PDA. So again, the list price was 328,000 for those Academic Complete titles versus 172,000 for the PDA titles. Um, the, the inter an interesting thing here is, is the average list price of titles that were used 
um, the PDA titles were more expensive and that probably reflects the sort of newer publication dates of the PDA titles. Um, but overall, everything else as far as year to date, academic complete still um, sort of outpaces PDA. Although, and there's you know another thing that to to take into account is academic complete in total comprises a little over 127,000 titles. PDA is right around 100,000 titles, so PDA has less titles available. Um, and then I did a comparison just this last month of July 2015, and that showed that PDA I think is actually catching up to academic complete as far as um, usage because actually the number of titles that were actually used was more in PDA even though there's more titles in academic complete available. For example, when a student student searches the catalog or when they search um, our our catalog is also made available through our discovery um, uh, tool. We use eBrae for that. So um, uh, just this last month. PDA actually had more usage than our academic complete titles. And another telling thing here is um, the average list price, again, uh, was way higher for PDA. And I put little asterisks by this number, $177, for the, the average list price of a title in PDA because um, something slipped through when I was adding titles one month because I noticed when I was looking at statistics and this sort of really threw me for a shot that there was a, a one title. It didn't trigger usage but uh, somebody had you know used it multiple times. There was an $18,000 title that um, was included in those statistics and I've since gone and actually removed that title because we just don't have the budget to um, actually you know get a um, you know, 20% of an $18,000 title for a one-day loan of that title, which was a, I think, a, like a seven-volume, you know, reference collection material. But um, if you if you take out that single title, the actual uh, average list price goes down to like $105 for those 247 titles. Um, now, given you know, this is like you know the best I could actually do with this sort of. Um, statistics that are provided to us through eBrary. And I sort of hinted at this. eBrary, um, I wish they there was more robust statistical tools or even just raw data that I could get at PDA. I, I haven't said that I haven't actually gone and and to the PDA people have access to uh, what time of day are, are our students figuring these things. Um, where I come from, et cetera. Um, right now, statistics um, aren't available. Um, and this is just right here a view of our top PDA titles. Um, as you can see, some of them, um, you know, got a lot of usage, um, and it, you know, these were probably ones that we ended up purchasing. But there's like some that, you know, get a hundred user sessions. Um, over over time, so that's pretty good. And um, just lastly, because I know we're out of time here, looking forward, um, things that we're keeping our eye out, we want to watch those prices and those those uh, multiplier percentages carefully to see how the the publishers going forward react. We want to get um, our hands on deeper usage analysis. We've also in invested in a PDA model for streaming video. Canopy is a company that. Um, does that and, and we're experimenting with that as well. Um, and then lastly, this is just a link to the slides and I'll have Krista mm -hmm. send that out to everyone yes. as well. Yep, yep, Dana, I was gonna let everyone know, yeah, Dana did send me the slides ahead of time yesterday, the day before. <laughs> yeah. um, so they will be included in the show's notes afterwards as well. Um, we do have one question that did just come in um, about patrons having to create accounts that um, if a patron has to create an account to request the books, does that create any sort of a privacy issue that you had to work with? Well, that was something. That's something that was existing before the PDA program. That's just part. You know, for example, that's just part of eBrary's model. That mm -hmm. if you want to actually print um, any of the text or download a book, or for example, they have a, a, a bookshelf feature that if you want to add books to a bookshelf so you can access them later, you need to. You know. Like most vendors, they want to get their hands on the some of the patron data, but all it does is all it is all it consists of 
and um, is them uh, creating a uh, you know giving them their email and what they want their username and password to be, mm -hmm. and then they'll get access to those extra features. Um, so that existed even in our subscription collections. Right. For so that. it has nothing to do with the PDA part that you're doing. Yeah. It's already part of using the eBooks. And from yeah. what you said, as far as privacy, that's very little information that they are having to give. So, and there's no connection to any of the library's um, databases or catalog or circulation no, or anything we like don't, that. You know, end. since we're an online only library, we don't have student data connected to our system at all. Oh, cool. We don't have any student data connected to that. Makes it even more secure. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, so anybody have any other questions? You can type them into the question section as we just got one here. Or if you have a microphone, just say unmute me and you can um, ask your question that way. We can Any last minute ones you want while, we'll stay, while we're still here on the line with Dana. Um, so this is really great. A lot, it's all the, a lot of good information statistics on here I think will be very helpful to people, as I said earlier, interested in this kind of um, collection development but wary. <laughs> of it. Um, but also, I, mean, I know some people think, oh, this kind of thing would be a huge money saver, but that's not really the right way to look at it, obviously. It's, I think what you said is the most important part. It's getting this, the, your users what they actually want. I mean, we have to guess sometimes <laughs> about what they want and what we think of in our expert opinion is something they could use. But this is really, you know, being even more um, responsive to what they are wa really wanting to look at. And I like the way that in that that aspect of it and how it's kind of also um, hidden that they don't even know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Behind and I just screen. want to put out there, if anyone's interested in just, you know, reaching out to me in any way, if you just Google disobedient librarian, that's my sort of online handle, mm -hmm. you'll find all my, my social media stuff and feel free to contact me with any questions going forward. Yeah. Yeah, great. All right. Well, it doesn't look like any last minute urgent questions came in now while we were chatting. Just a few people saying thanks. Thank you very much. Great information. Um, so let's see here. I'm just getting myself situated. So I think since we don't seem to have anybody who needs to ask any questions at the moment, um, as Dana said, you can go ahead and reach out to her um, afterwards. I'm just going to pull back my presenter control to my screen if I can get it to go here. There we go. There we go. All right, so that will wrap it up for this week's edition of Encompass Live. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, the show has been recorded and will be made available on our uh, archive page here on our library, um, Encompass Live website right down here at the bottom. We have our archive sessions links, and um, most likely later today I should get it up here, the recording, link to the presentation. And <clears throat> at the beginning of the presentation, there are a couple of articles, um, reports that Dana mentioned. I've grabbed those links as well to um, include in the recording page. So um, you'll be notified when that is available. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is the new accreditation guidelines as a planning tool. This is a very Nebraska-centric topic. Um, we have accreditation for public libraries that um, our libraries can work towards, and we have some um, new guidelines related to that that you libraries can use for planning. So um, Richard Miller and Laura Johnson, who are from our library development department here at the Library Commission, along with one of our system and um, coordinators, Denise Harders, are going to be online with us next week to talk about using strategic planning to help with your accreditation. So I hope you sign up for that and any of our other future sessions that you can see here on our Encompass Live page. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, please do go over there and like our page. Once it loads up here, there we go. Um, you will see notifications of when the recordings are available, when new shows are coming up. I give a reminder here, as I did this morning, of when a new um, oops, that was the last week's um, when a new show is coming up on uh, going to be um, starting. So you can uh, see what's going on there if you're a big Facebook user. Other than that, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye. <laughs>